Welcome to 100, we're doing geometric optics today. This is a two week lab, so it's gonna be a longer than usual video. Um, I'm going to keep it as short as I can by editing out uh, stuff that you don't need to see or that really isn't, um, that doesn't translate well over video because ultimately we are doing this for the most part in the dark. So I will make this video as meaningful as possible for you to get a total easy A on the lab report. And um, I say that because traditionally, when students come into the lab to do this particular um, experiment, it, in my experience, it is the lowest scoring lab of the semester. And I won't get into why, but um, um, let's just say that we are avoiding all those pitfalls in this video. Well, one of those pitfalls is going to be on you, though, and that one is you should probably read your textbook first. And the reason I say that is because um, unlike other labs where you could kind of just walk in and start mechanically collecting data without really understanding the fundamentals of what's going on behind the experiment, this one isn't like that. <clears throat> um, Okay, it's not going to be as challenging if you didn't know what's going on because I'm the one manipulating things and setting things up. Uh, but nevertheless, you are really going to be cheating yourself out of the opportunity to learn. Um, you're going to have to read the textbook anyway in your lecture portion of the class, so why not just do it now? Then, when we do the lab in a minute, it will be a way of affirming those things that you've already been exposed to and already have started to learn. And while you're reading the textbook, you could make a mental note of things that you're confused about. Perhaps they'll show up in this video and then they will be more clear. Uh, but um, what you really don't want to do is just kind of watch this video if you know nothing about lenses and just blindly go along with, you know, what I'm doing and how we're collecting data. Yeah, you're just shortchanging yourself significantly. So if you want to get uh, an A not only in uh, when you turn in this lab report, but also in the portion of your lecture test that deals with lenses, read your textbook first and uh, get a jump on understanding this material. So um, with that said, we are going to start the first part of the lab, which deals with convex lenses. Ultimately, there'll be two types of lenses that we're gonna use in this lab. One of them is the convex lens and the other is the concave. Uh, convex is um, uh, easier to understand and I'll show you what I mean by that momentarily. What I'll do is, even though you've already read your textbook, I'm gonna just uh, do a quick recap on image formation, uh, geometric optic uh, uh, ray diagrams, and just to make sure that we're on the same page and everything is clear. So let me put you on pause. Okay, so here we go. For this particular lab, we are dealing with two different types of lenses, a convex or converging lens and a concave or diverging lens. Um, let us forget about this concave lens for the moment because these are the type, these converging lenses, uh, that we are going to use for the first part of our lab. So we'll just talk about those for now and then get back to the lab. Uh, we have about four, maybe five, I'm not sure off the top of my head, uh, different lenses, and we're gonna uh, do measurements on all those lenses. And um, the, what differentiates them are their focal lengths. So it's important that you understand what uh, the focal length of a lens means. Now, for this particular lens here, I drew it such that its focal length is 10 centimeters. In other words, from the center of the lens to this dot is 10 centimeters. Likewise, from this dot to the center of the lens here on the left, that's 10 centimeters. So uh, let's see what that means for us. By the way, this is an imaginary line going right through our lens and is normal to its surface. And that's just uh, to help us draw these ray diagrams. So, if I were to produce light in such a way that the light rays came in parallel to this line, uh, they would be diffracted at uh, two points. Uh, at one point is at the surface of this lens on its left side, so it's going to be diffracted a little bit. And then 
when it's in travel, if it'll be diffracted and travel through the glass of the lens, then it will come upon the uh, surface on the right side of the lens and it'll be diffracted again. So the fact that it is diffracted twice doesn't concern us. Bottom line is when it emerges from the right side of this lens, it is going to be on a different path than it originally was. And that path is one such that the light goes right through that focal point. And that is uh, by definition what a lens with a given focal point is, while well, a convex lens uh, in this circumstance. So if I draw any ray of light that is parallel to this imaginary axis here, it is going to emerge on the other side and go through that uh, point that is located 10 centimeters to the right. So what um, I want you to realize also is that these paths are indeed reversible. In other words, let's say I wasn't um, shining light from my left to right. Let's say I started over here and I configured my source, maybe my little laser or whatever I have. Um, I produced a ray of light that traveled along this path, a path that went right through its focal point. So it's traveling in this direction. If light goes through the focal point of a lens, it is diffracted in such a way that when it exits that lens, it is parallel to this imaginary axis. So if the light originated towards my left along these paths, it would come out parallel. Now that is indeed important to us because it's going to help us draw these uh, ray diagrams. And let's see. Let's go ahead and use uh, what we just learned to determine where an image would form. So let's say I have an object right here. This is my object. And I wanna see where this lens produces an image. This is how we go about doing it. Let me uh, focus on the tip of this arrow. Now, the first ray of light that uh, I want to draw is one that is parallel to this axis. I mean, ultimately, light is emanating from that source <clears throat> in all directions, right? Uh, most of these directions don't even, uh, you know, these light rays don't even go through the lens. What I am interested in are three directions. There are three directions. There are three important directions uh, because for those particular directions, I know exactly how the light behaves once it goes through the lens. The first one is obviously the ray that is parallel to this axis. So I'm gonna go ahead and draw that. Now, how does that light behave once it exits our lens? It goes right through the focal point. Now, what is another direction that I definitely uh, know what direction it will travel once it goes through the lens? A light ray that goes through the focal point here. <clears throat> A light ray that goes through the focal point on one side of the lens emerges on the other side of the lens that is parallel this axis. <clears throat> now there's a third ray that I know, um, you know, how it behaves once it goes through the lens. I didn't talk about it yet, but it's totally trivial. That is a ray that goes directly through its center. A light ray that goes directly through the center is not diffracted at all. Or let's say, okay, maybe there's a little diffraction on one end, but when it crosses the other end, it's diffracted, and it points it back to its original direction. I just made that up on the fly, but the geometry, see, it seems to hold true. Anyway, 
I'm going to draw a ray of light from the tip of this arrow that goes right through the center of this lens that I know that it does not diffract in such a way that its direction changes. You can see that all of these three different light rays intersect at this point. What is the significance of that point? All those light rays came from the tip of this arrow and ultimately what they what is what is happening is that if I was to put a screen here these light rays would hit that screen I wouldn't really get an image it'd just be some blurred mess but if I move the screen closer and closer and closer it start getting more in focus more in focus until I hit this point here where all those rays form a crisp sharp image so <clears throat> Just by simply drawing three different light rays coming out of this object, I'm easily able to determine where my image is formed. So, only if it was that easy. There's a little bit of notation that we need to commit to memory. Now, in doing so, I need to talk about the front of the lens and the back of the lens. Now, if I have this ordinary end lens, um, it, intrinsically, there's no front or back. In other words, I can remove this lens, flip it, put it back, and it would still produce the same image from the same object produced at that distance. So there is no technically front or back of the lens. But if we <clears throat> prepare a system like object, lens, image or a system with multiple lenses, we need to designate a front and a back, and you'll understand shortly what I mean by that, but uh, let's go ahead and define a front, a front and a back. If light is coming from my left and incident on the left edge of the, or left side of the lens, this left side is called the front of the lens. Pretty intuitive, right? Then, of course, this is called the back of the lens. Light is traveling in this direction, so this is the front of the lens. Likewise, if I remove that object and put the object over here, a flashlight over here, then this becomes the front of the lens, and uh, the other side is the back. But anyway, for this particular case, this is the front. and. There is a distance between the center of this lens and my object. That distance is labeled as P. There is also a distance between the center of this lens and the location of my image. And that distance is designated the symbol Q. Now, <clears throat> let's say after drawing this uh, ray diagram that it ends up that my image was formed somewhere over here. I know that may seem confusing at this point, but it'll be crystal clear in a minute. Let's say the image was formed over here. The distance between the image and the lens is still indeed called Q, but in this case, since the image is formed in front of the lens, I have to uh, give that value of Q a negative value. So that's why it is important to recognize what's the front of the mirror and the back of the mirror and to know what sign to give these P's and Q's. Whenever P is on the front of the mirror, it's positive. Whenever Q is in the, the I called it mirror, whenever Q <clears throat> is in back of the lens, it's positive. It's when those P's and Q's are reversed that you have to give it an opposite sign. So hopefully that isn't too confusing. And I think we will clear that up with the next ray diagram that we are going to do. Let's go ahead and construct a ray diagram that indeed produces an image that is not in the back of the lens, but rather in front of the lens. So that there is my object. And let's see, you know what? I'm gonna make it a little bit smaller 
but just so that lines aren't going all off the chalkboard. You'll see what I mean sh maybe shortly. Okay, that's better. Uh, <clears throat> what's the first line that I want to draw? I always go with the parallel one. It's the easiest, right? So I have a light ray that is coming in parallel. And it's easy because I know exactly how a parallel light behaves when it is incident upon a convex lens. It bends in such a way that the resulting light ray goes through its focal point. Now, what was the other uh, easy one? Well, the one that goes right through the center, right? So there's the center. And the last one, a ray that goes through the focal point on one side of the lens, emerges on the other side in a way that is parallel to this axis. So um, what I'm going to do is put the tip of this object against, let me align the tip and the focal point. This is a dashed line here. Obviously, I mean, light didn't necessarily go through that focal point, but this ray of light here is indeed in the direction of a ray of light as if it did go through that focal point. And what happens if a ray of light goes through that focal point or in that direction of the focal point and hits this lens? it is parallel to this axis. Now, if we put a screen over here, there's no way we get an image. These don't uh, like converge into one spot. So, what does that mean? We would need additional optics to see an image. Well our eyeballs are additional objects. If I was to look with my eye at these uh, seemingly, well, they are uh, diverging, but if I was to look at my eye at these diverging rays, I would indeed see an image and this is how. My, <clears throat> my eye wouldn't know that they came from this spot. They came from this spot and were redirected into different orientations but my eye would know that. They would just see them as straight lines. So let's follow them back to see where they appear to have emerged. So I just traced that one backwards. And perhaps I should have been using a ruler. I could probably do this quicker without a ruler. If I was to trace them back, they all seem to originate from this point. In other words, <clears throat> my eye would see this object as an image at this location. So this here is my image. Now, by definition, what is the distance between object and lens called, that is P. And distance between image and lens is indeed Q. The important thing to realize here is that since Q is not on its typical side of the lens, which is the back. I say typical because that's where by definition it is positive. It is on the other side. It is on the front side of the lens. So this Q, we must give it a negative value. In other words, let's say we measured from here to here and that turned out to be 
13 centimeters. Our Q would be negative 13 centimeters. Two more things and we're done. Magnification. Um, let's see, I wonder if I should erase this. Magnification, and this is by definition. So I can either write that, or, well, I'll just do it like this. Magnification, by definition, is h prime over h, where the image height This distance here, I'm calling the image height h prime, and <laughs> this here is h, the height of the object. So if you measured the height of the object and measured the height of the image and put the image over object measurements, took the ratio, you would get the magnification of the image. If you worked out the geometry of this, you would also find that the magnification is equal to negative Q over P. <clears throat> so for this case, P is in the front of the lens, so it's positive. Q is in the back of the lens, so it is positive as well. So I have positive P and a positive Q. And that gives me an overall negative magnification. I bring this up uh, just to let you know that the negative sign in the magnification has nothing to do with how big something is. It has to do whether or not the image is upright or inverted. So in this particular case, Q positive, P positive, my magnification is negative. That means that my image is inverted. And as you can see, the arrow where it originally pointed up is now pointing down. It is indeed inverted. For this case here, I have a P that is positive and a Q because it's on this side of the lens, it is negative. So I have positive P and a negative Q, but there's a negative here. So that negative takes care of the negative associated with that Q. So my overall magnification is positive. In other words, it is not inverted. And you can see that these do indeed both point up in the same direction. I mean, furthermore, Q is larger than P. Q is larger than P. So my M is gonna be greater than one and you, and you can indeed see that the image is larger than the object. That was easy, right? <laughs> Let's get back to the lab, uh, get our four lenses. We're gonna have lenses of nominal values, uh, five centimeter, 10 centimeter, 15 centimeter, and 25 centimeter. Now, some, I mean, they're, they're relatively close. I, I want to say like for the 15 centimeter lens, that's more like 17 point something, I think. Um, so those are just nominal values. It'll be our job to determine what those focal lengths of the lenses actually are. And uh, yeah, what fun would it be if they gave us lenses that had exact values, you know? Um, we don't, so we don't really know what they are and we are going to find them. Let me put you on pause. Sorry about that guys, real quick, before we go into the garage, uh, there is uh, one thing I wanted to mention. So we talked about the front and back of the mirror, the P's and the Q's, whether or not they're positive or negative, talked about magnification. There's one thing I failed to mention though. When we're dealing with um, images and objects, they can be of two types, real or virtual. So uh, let me just briefly say what that is. <clears throat> Strictly speaking, by definition, um, a real image is one that light actually passes through. So, well, that's it. That's your definition. <laughs> but we can elaborate on that. <clears throat> if I get a, um, uh, a screen, I can project an image on that screen with a real image because the light is actually there. 
So a real image can be projected onto a screen. Now, consider this image here. <clears throat> By definition, it is a virtual image because light does not actually pass through this image. Remember, uh, we trace these rays back to where they appear to originate. They didn't actually originate there, so light doesn't pass through that image. Furthermore, if I was to put a screen here, there, no, there, there, there would be no image projected onto that screen because this light doesn't even exist there. So uh, this is a virtual image. <clears throat> um, for the most part, our objects are going to be real. In some cases, though, objects can be virtual objects as well. And at the top of my head, I don't think that we deal with virtual objects in this lab. Could be wrong, but anyway, read up on them because um, that would be a great question to be on a test, you know, to, to, um, a system of lenses that do incorporate <clears throat> this notion of a um, virtual object. I mean, ultimately, if you have a couple of lenses, your first lens produces an image and you use that image as the second lens's object. And depending upon where that image produced from the first lens is located, it, it, it potentially can be a, 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 a virtual image or virtual object for the second lens. But anyway, like I said, I'm not sure um, <clears throat> if we deal with that in this lab. If we do, maybe I'll bring it up again, but um, get clear in your mind the difference between real images and virtual images. So now for real. Let's get back to the lab. But wait, there's more. I did a lot of talking about P's and Q's, and um, of course I related those to um, determining the magnification, but the P's and the Q's play a much larger role than just that. So I need to uh, talk about this. It'll only take a minute. Now, there is an equation known as the thin lens equation, and it simply is 1 over f is equal to 1 over p plus 1 over q. And you will be using that um, repeatedly throughout the course of this lab. So <clears throat> um, p, as always, distance between object and lens, Q, distance between lens and image, F is that uh, inherent uh, length associated with a particular lens, the focal length, and this expression relates those three variables, or those three quantities, so that is important and we'll be using it a lot. There is one other expression Let's say I have two lenses butted up against each other. This holds true. The inverse of the focal length of lens one plus the inverse of the focal length of lens two is going to be equal to the inverse of the total focal length. In other words, <clears throat> if I butt up two lenses, put them in a lens holder, and put them P distance from the object, find the image, which is Q, I can take away those two lenses and replace it with a single lens of focal length F total, which will give me the same image. So it's had the same P's and Q's, same magnification and whatnot. Um, so we will be using this as well. So now, really, let's start this thing. Okay, let's get started with this lab. Now, I suppose we should go over the equipment first. What we have is, uh, for this first part, is well just three items we have an object we have a lens and we have a screen so that we can find our image now our object uh, we could use a lot of different things in fact uh, sometimes in the lab um, 
We have this here as an object. Uh, what it is is a light bulb encased in this metal box here. And the light comes out of this hole. And there's a transparency that fits on the end here. Now, that uh, <clears throat> this design makes an image on our screen, but we're not gonna use this. And the reason being is that this introduces a lot of error. I discovered by playing around with this that it isn't obvious when this design be becomes focused on our screen. Y y there's a lot of judgment call. And uh, once you find what you think is the best location for the screen that produces the best image, you can move it back and forth up to like three, four centimeters and still not have um, an obvious or apparent um, deviation from a nice focused image. It, it's hard to tell. So <clears throat> we're introducing a lot of air by using this. So what we're gonna do today is just simply um, use that light bulb without this. So right here is our light bulb and I just got a can and uh, cut it a bit so that it fits on top. And the purpose of that is just so that that light doesn't blind me. <laughs> We're gonna be doing this in the dark and it is rather bright. So that is our object, the bulb. This is <clears throat> our lens holder and I could switch out lenses and I'm going to do that. We're gonna do that together with uh, four different lenses. So we will start with our first lens, which will be a lens with a nominal focal length of 20. In the other video, I said our largest uh, focal length lens uh, was 25. Well, it's 20. So we have 5, 10, 15, and 20. Now, instead of doing it in that order, 5, 10, 15, 20, we're going to do it. We're going to do it in the opposite order, and the reason being is because these lenses that have the larger focal lengths are easier to work with. The um, images are uh, uh, easier to display on the screen. It's easier to determine the exact position the screen should be in. It, it, it has a relatively nice, sharp image associated with it. So why start with the harder ones first, right? We'll, we'll do the easy ones and build up to those more challenging ones. So we will start with the uh, 20 uh, centimeter lens. It's already in the lens holder. And this is my uh, screen. Actually, I need to slide a piece of paper in here, which I'll do. And we are going to <clears throat> pick P1. Now, I have a table that I made that's sim similar to the one that you have in your lab manual. You'll see in the first column there, it gives those uh, nominal lens values, 5, 10, 15, 20. The second column is to find the focal length, <clears throat> measure the focal length for <clears throat> P much greater than F. That's really easy, but we are going to save that till later. The reason being is that I'm gonna to have to move this equipment towards the center of the garage and I don't wanna do that right now. So we'll get back to that and that's like, we'll knock that out quick if there's nothing to it. So we will start with the next column over. We are going to pick P1. <clears throat> Distance between object and lens is P. So this is gonna be our P1. We are going to pick P1 and well, let's just go ahead and pick it now. So we'll, we will pick 30 centimeters. <clears throat> now we have to find <coughs> Q. And Q is the distance the screen is from this lens. Now, uh, speaking of this equipment, uh, let's get our coordinate system straight. This rail here has um, a scale on it. It begins at zero and it increases all the way up to 200, 200 centimeters. So in the course of this experiment, when we're moving stuff around, I'm not gonna necessarily give you a P value of say uh, 30, why? I just did right a moment ago. Okay, I, um, in general, instead of giving you a direct um, numerical value of P, I'm going to say 
I'm going to tell you that this is mounted. At what location on this tra track is this mounted? And then you could just figure out what that P is yourself. Um, this object, I conveniently placed it so that the bulb is located at uh, 190, 190 centimeters. And unless I say otherwise, it's going to stay put. I'm not going to move it. So our object is always at 190. So where do you think this lens holder is now? Remember I said um, for our first P1 that we're supposed to pick, we, we are picking 30. So this is at 160. 190 minus 160 is 30, 30 centimeters. So to find our Q value, we will subtract um, this position from this position. This is 160, this one we have to find. So um, let's go ahead and do that. And let me see, is there anything else you need to know? No, I don't think so. So uh, what I'll do is I'll put you on pause and position you, the viewer, uh, right here. This is where the camera will, will be so that you can get a close up of that screen and I'm going to move this back and forth so that I can find this uh, correct P value where the image is focused on that screen. So let me put you on pause. So let's figure out what this P value is. Again, the P value is gonna be the distance between the lens and the image formed and the way we could pinpoint where that image is being formed is if we place this screen at the same location as the formed image. If we do that, we'll get a nice crisp image on this screen. So let me move it back. And I'm going in the right direction. Let me zoom in on that for you because it's getting clearer. And there we go. So uh, right now I'm looking at both the image on the screen and I'm looking at the image on the uh, camera. In other words, I'm looking at what you're looking at. And what you're looking at isn't as nice as the actual image on the screen. In other words, the, the video doesn't capture what that screen truly looks like. Um, I mean, it is dark in here. There's light bouncing around off that screen. It, it just, it doesn't do it justice. And I, the, from looking at the screen directly um, with my eyes, as opposed to the camera, it looks like I could actually reach out and grab a light bulb that is there on the screen. So um, you'll just have to take my word for it. Now what I wanna do is find out what the error associated with that measurement of Q is going to be and I'm going to do that in just a second. What I first want to do is give you the actual um, measurement or position of the screen. So I have my flashlight, I'm looking at the scale and it is located at uh, 191, 191 191.8, 191.8. So I'm going to write that down. One. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, 91.8, forget the one, it's not 191.8, it is 91.8, 91.8, don't make that mistake. So um, our screen is at 91.8. Now I'm going to move it farther away just a little bit until it becomes, until it starts to get out of focus. Okay, now it's starting to get out of focus, and that is at um, 89.7. Actually, you don't need to record that. I'll just give you the delta Q. And when I, when I move it in the opposite direction, uh, I, I refocused it, then I continued uh, moving it in that 
opposite direction and until it, it, it started to become out of focus. And that occurs at 92.9. So I need to take the difference of those two numbers to get my delta Q. So let me refocus this guy. Okay, there he is, refocus. And let me put you on pause. Okay, just a quick recap on what we just did. Um, by the way, when I put my lens holder on some position, I'm going to give you that measurement to the tens place in centimeters. So as before, I said this was at 160. Actually, let, let's call that 160.0. And the object, that light bulb, was at 190. We'll make that 190.0. And in case this, come ups, this comes up in your lab, the error in those measurements, we'll just call them plus or minus 0.5. Um, but I don't think we'll need that. They do ask you for the error in this. Now, we found that <clears throat> we were able to move this to a position so that we had a nice crisp image and that was at 91.8 centimeters <clears throat> so your q would be 160.0 minus 91.8 that is your q value so what is your delta q now if you recall um, what i did was i got it in focus and then i started moving it uh, to our left until i could visibly see it becoming out of focus and then stopped record its new distance to, to see how much I had to move it back. Then I refocused it and then I did that the same thing but going in the other direction. I moved it closer to the lens and slowly until I could visibly see that it was getting out of focus, stopped, recorded that value. So I added those two little distances together and I got three point two centimeters so that is going to be our delta q our delta q is off by up to 3.2 centimeters and um, <clears throat> it's larger than i thought it would be but i'd rather err on the side of well i'd rather be um i'd rather be generous with that air um, so 3.2 centimeters now this is pretty, pretty far. It's pretty, this is a pretty long distance compared to three centimeters. So the relative air in Delta Q should be relatively low. Uh, let's see what else. Now, oh, you are going to need an image height. So what I will do is, <clears throat> I'm looking at the image right now. And what I'm going to do is, <clears throat> I'm going to mark the top and bottom of the bulb and have you guys measure it. So, I don't know if I want to use the vernier calipers. I know probably you don't want me to because these it's going to be more involved for you to read this. Um, this may be overkill, overkill on the accuracy, although this very well may come in handy when we get to smaller images we want. We may very well want those extra, extra um, significant figures. I'll either measure it with this, photograph the caliper so that you can read it, or I'll just simply lay a ruler on top of that uh, screen and you can measure the distance between the two little dots that I made on that screen. <clears throat> Again, the image was that inverted light bulb, so I just made a little mark on top and a mark on bottom. So I'll have to get that to you and I'll also get to you the height of our object. And all that entails is just turning off this light, waiting for that bulb to cool down and using these to measure its height. Now, if the um, 
if the thin lens equation works, or if it's valid, which it is, 1 over p plus 1 over q is going to equal 1 over f, where f is the focal length of that uh, lens. So if we just found the correct configuration where the p's and q's um, satisfy that equation, is it not fair to say that for this p and this q, I could interchange them? If I, if I change p to the value of q and q to the value of p, 1 over p plus 1 over q is still going to equal 1 over f. Um, in other words, the distance from here to here is about 70 centimeters. Our q is about 70 centimeters, and our p is 30. So what if I made our p 70 centimeters and our q 30? That satisfies the uh, lens equation as well, right? Well, let's go ahead and do that. Um, I'm going to pick then for our P1, I'm going to pick 70 centimeters. And um, I should be able to find an image without even really moving that. It's not going to be dead on because this isn't exactly 70. Um, it's, 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 what is it, 68.2 centimeters? Let's see, uh, let me put this, let me make P 70. That puts me at one, 120. So this lens right now is at 120, right? 190 minus 120 is 70. So I should be getting an image there um, after, of course, I fine tune it because, again, it was 68.2, not exactly 70. And it's right there. There's where our image is. And uh, for the heck of it, I'll let you see it. So uh, I'm not, well, let me, let me just fine tune it. By the way, food for thought. <clears throat> Magnification is negative Q over P. In our first configuration, Q was larger than P. Forget about the negative. The negative just means that the bulb was inverted, which indeed it was. But the Q is lar was larger than the P, so our magnification was greater than one. It was bigger than the actual bulb. Now, our Q is smaller than P. So the ratio of Q to P is going to be less than 1. So our magnification is going to be smaller than you know, the actual bulb, which makes things a little harder. It's, it's, it's harder to fine-tune this to find the right spot because instead of having this big bulb on the screen, now it's this like, tiny little guy. But uh, let me put you on pause real quick and switch you over so you can see it. So without moving anything, um, there you see the image focused on uh, that screen, and look how tiny it is. In fact, I, I'm looking at the marks I made from the previous image. Our previous image was this big. And this bulb, it, it's not this whole thing. That's the hole in that can that I put in it, or out on it. The actual bulb is within the jaws of the calipers right there. See how small it is compared to the other case there? Um, <clears throat> and I'm, I'm not even gonna bother trying to find a delta uh, Q. It, it's, it, it's hard to see when this thing becomes unfocused. But anyway, they only wanted us to find a delta Q once. And we already did that, so we're good. Let me zoom in on this. And I don't think that does much difference on your end. It, um, you can kind of see the image there. <clears throat> and once more, I'm looking at this image directly with my eyes as opposed to through the, cam through the camera. And it looks like an actual light bulb is, is in that piece of paper. Uh, but there you go. There is the other image uh, location. And 
Well, I didn't tell you what it is, did I? Have my flashlight out and I'm reading it to be, oh, let's see. Um, 89.5 I'm sorry 89.05 89.05 okay quick recap so for our F20 nominal value, um, we picked the P1 and then moved this around, found the Q1, measured the Q1. Uh, we found the Delta Q1. By the way, Delta Q1, it's in my table, but it's not in yours. Um, the, the table in your lab manual doesn't have a Delta Q1. Somewhere in there, it asks you to find a Delta Q. Um, I personally was going to find a Delta Q1 for each of these lenses, but I'm not. That's that's overkill. Um, um, so we'll just follow the lab manual. We already found the Delta Q, so we're good. What is what? 3.2 centimeters. That's all they asked for. That's all we're giving them. Um, <clears throat> they want your the height of the image. So. <clears throat> This is, the, this is the paper that was in the screen, and I don't know if you can see, there are two marks, one there and one there. <clears throat> now, this is labeled <clears throat> F20, and um, it's labeled H prime one. They're calling the image height just H, H1. Um, uh, usually, uh, my H, is the height of the object. And then when I measure my image, that's H prime. That's why you see my little H prime one. And the reason I'm explaining my notation is because I'm probably gonna take a picture of this with uh, a ruler <clears throat> um, laid next to it or Vernier calipers, depending upon my mood. I don't know, maybe I'll just do it for you. But um, anyway, that was for um, H prime one. And this is H prime two. You can see how close they are together. So we need to measure those distances to find the image height, which is here. <clears throat> your lab manual is only asking for the height of your first image. They're not making you do it twice. That makes our job easier because, oh, totally easier. Just three, just three more little marks on that. <laughs> um, and that's it. Now we just need to do that for the nominal values of 10, 15, and 20, and it's gonna go by a lot quicker uh, because I've already explained exactly uh, what the process is. So um, let me put you on pause so I could swap that out with another lens. Okay, let's see how quick we can knock the rest of these lenses out. By the way, I need to make a little correction, so I'm sorry. But um, I told you this was located at 190, then I said actually 190.0. 190.0. I forgot the hundreds digit. This, um, wherever I told you it was, add a zero to it. Uh, in other words, it, this lens <clears throat> for the first one was at 160.0, it was at 160.00. Um, again, the errors associated with wherever I put this lens or the object is gonna be, like I said, plus or minus 0.05. Um, but um, I just forgot that 100, 100 place zero. And um, I just want to be, we want to be correct in our measurements. Uh, so throw that out there. Um, now, I replaced 
the nominal uh, f20 lens with the f15 uh, lens and we need to pick a p and the p i pick is 20 centimeters in other words this is located right now at 170.00 190.00 minus 170.00 is 20.00. So uh, our P is 20, and let's see where our image is formed. Put you on pause and mount you right over here. Okay, so you're looking at the screen. We don't have anything in focus. I'm going to start moving it back. It's getting better and better and better and better. Let me put two hands on it and slow its movement down. That looks good right there. Let me zoom in on it. <clears throat> so there you go. And if I could find again my flashlight in the dark, I'll give you the position of that screen. The position of that screen is 112.20. And what I will try and do is mark the image so that we could measure it. So I put two pen, pen marks and I will now put you on pause. Okay, so we are still on the F15 lens and now I want to pick my P2, my chosen value of P, my second one. And I pick, I'm putting this somewhat arbitrarily, I scooted it on over to 155, 155.00 centimeters. And now I'm going to see what value of Q pertains to this particular value of P. So put you on pause, mount you up on that little fridge. So there's a screen and I'm moving it closer, 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 closer. The bulb is, <laughs> I'm focusing on the little filament. Get that filament in focus. So it's, to see but um, there you go there is my image of that bulb and I don't need to mess around with marking the top and the bottom we're not uh, we're not concerned with the height we're just concerned with the position that that image um, is formed and our screen is now located at let's see 127.00 I'm sorry, 0 127.90, let me double check. Um, moving right along, we are now working on the lens with the nominal focal length of 10, 10 centimeters. So that new lens is placed in the lens holder. I somewhat arbitrarily placed this a certain distance from our object and it is at 175.00 so um, I won't tell you what P is I'll let you figure that out of course it's nothing more than 190.00 minus 175.00 and let us find out what our Q is I'll put you back up there and well so you can see the screen So here we go, I'm sliding this forward.
just fine tuning it. Let me zoom in on that. And there is our image. <clears throat> uh, by the way, I didn't mention this before, but you see this outline here? So that has nothing to do with the bulb. That is just the hole that I cut in our can. So <clears throat> here's our bulb, and I will mark its position so that we can measure its height. And there we go. So let's find another value of P. Let me put you on pause. Now we are going to pick our Q, sorry, our P2, our P2, our, our second value of P. By the way, apologize. I did not give you the location of the screen for our um, last uh, trial. The value is 149.35. So that was our Q1 for our F15 uh, lens. So where would you like to put uh, this here? Right now it's on 175. Um, I'm trying to read your mind. 165 you say? Sure. It is now on 165.00. And I'll put you on pause and we'll adjust this screen. So I'm moving the screen. And since the magnification is um, less than one, I'm getting a, a smaller image, which is harder to uh, focus in on or find the most crisp image. In any case, there it is. Um, video doesn't do it, do it justice, but trust me, it looks very good, very clear. So uh, there you go. We are, let me get my flashlight. We are at, or in other words, our screen is at a new location now. Our screen is located at 149.200. Uh, 149.20. I'm sorry. 149.20. And... Let me put you on pause. Lens four, nominal F5, arbitrarily at 183.00. And let's see if we can get that focus. Hold on. So let's slide this back and forth. Okay, here we go. This one seems hard, like, I don't know why, it seems harder to get into focus. Um, just moving it a little bit focuses on a different part of the bulb. Um, that filament that I was trying to focus on, I don't, <laughs> I can't tell if I'm focusing on the rear or, or front. Nah, never mind. Okay, there we go. Um, that's a big one. Let's mark it. I can't even tell exactly what the top is. <clears throat> okay, there we go. Let's pick a new P2. Okay, so again, <clears throat> I forgot to give you the location of this screen for the previous run. 
the location of the screen was at 163.30. So that would be your uh, Q1 for your F5 lens. Now, we need to pick a P2, and I've picked it already. It is at uh, 173.00, and I went ahead and refocused this, and uh, the image is so small, it was hard. There's gonna be more air associated with this um, measurement than the others, but I think I found the right uh, location, and you don't need to see it, right? It is 164.90. So the screen now, with this new value of um, uh, P2, 190, 173, the screen is now located at 164.90. Um, okay, cool. <laughs> when I close my eyes, there's this, uh, I'm looking at a, a bright dot, which is concerning me. <laughs> Imagine that, me messing up my vision with this experiment. That, 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 that can't be good. Hopefully it goes away. This, I guess I'm uh, staring at that screen too much. Anyway, um, that's it for this part. So uh, let me put you on pause and we'll knock out the rest of it. Okay, we're gonna do the part now where we put our object or source infinitely far away from the lens so that we could determine its focal length. Now, this is probably gonna be the most accurate way in which we find the focal length, uh, but uh, we'll see, we'll compare it to the others uh, when we've taken all these measurements. And the reason this works is because uh, from the thins land equa equation, we get one over F is equal to one over P plus one over Q. Now, uh, since P is the distance between our object or light source and lens, and that P is in this case infinitely far away, let's say like a million miles. One over a million, well zero essentially, right? So our equation essentially becomes one over F is equal to one over uh, Q. So F is equal to Q. Now, um, how far is infinitely far away? I moved our track so that it is situated diagonally across my garage, just so that I have um, the largest distance possible. So one end of the garage, there is a screen, and on the other, there is a lamp. Now, that lamp is about 550 centimeters from the screen. And if that is indeed our, um, or 550 uh, centimeters from my lens, and if that is indeed the, um, um, our P value, one over P, one over 550 is essentially zero. It's like 0 0.002. So we can uh, neglect that term and again, we are left with one over F is equal to one over Q. So I'm gonna have my screen, I'm gonna have my lens, and I'm gonna have a source way far away over here. And I'm going to move my lens back and forth so that I get an image on my screen. And whatever this distance is, which is our Q, that is the same as our F. Let's. See, let me show you what we have set up here. Um, I'm gonna put you on pause and turn the camera around. So that screen is essentially pretty much backed up against that wall there. And I'll move this back and forth uh, to find the image projected on that screen. And I'll show you what the other side looks like. So here's the other side of the garage. Now, this may look like it's close by, but it's not. This here is a lamp that is up against that corner over there. So again, that lamp is uh, 550 centimeters from my lens over here. So it's infinitely far away. Okay, so 
This lens in the lens holder is the nominal five centimeter uh, focal length lens. And I moved it back and forth and I got an image on the screen. Now that image was pretty hard to uh, focus. In fact, I had to use this little uh, magnifying glass. In the center there, you, uh, on your end, all you see is just a, uh, uh, a bright light. But in the center with the magnifying glass, I could see the outline of a bulb, the bulb coming from that uh, lamp on the other side of the room. So that's how I know that it's, it's uh, <clears throat> pretty much in focus. So that, I'm turning on my flashlight now, is located at, the, the lens is located at 4.85 centimeters. By the way, for this particular setup, what I was able to do is mount this screen at the origin of our track. So this screen is located at 0, 0.00 centimeters. So no calculations involved in this part of the lab, right? Whatever uh, value I read off, that is what our uh, experimental focal length is. And again, for this nominal five centimeter uh, focal length lens, we got 4.85. So my plan is to just kind of rip right through these. Let me put you on pause and switch out that lens holder with a new lens. And here is our nominal 10 centimeter focal length lens. I already moved it back and forth and found uh, the image there. And the lens is situated at 9.70 centimeters. Uh, earlier, I made the comment that this may be the most accurate way of determining the focal length. Um, maybe I spoke too soon. These are rather difficult uh, uh, to, to find these images because they're so tiny. It's hard to kind of tell when they are indeed focused. But um, uh, let's see how our data looks uh, when all is said and done, when all of our measurements come in. So let's move on to the next lens. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, you see that black ring in the center of that dot? Sorry, I'm totally winging this. I was holding uh, this magnifying glass with my hand. Um, that's how I know that that the image is focused. Um, it doesn't, <clears throat> I can see it on the screen. It doesn't translate well on video, but that black ring is the outer casing of the lamp. So as the lenses, uh, as we get larger uh, focal length lenses, it's a little bit easier to uh, find that image. So this right here is the nominal 15 centimeter lens. And I have a flashlight on right now. I wanna tell you what uh, position that lens holder is in. And it is at 15.65. 15.65. Let me write that down. And I'll put you on pause, get the last lens. And here is the last lens, the nominal 20 centimeter focal length lens. And I really put you up against that screen so you can see that um, uh, the image, the center uh, bright spot is the actual bulb. And then uh, the outer ring is the, um, uh, the like the lamp shade, the, the, the black metal part that's illuminated uh, or the bulb screws into, you know. So uh, it is in focus and the position of that lens is 22.00 centimeters. And I'm moving it kind of back and forth. You, you can see how it becomes out of focus, then in focus and um, if I put it <clears throat> at 22.00 centimeters, we get the actual image of the bulb in that lamp. So there we go. We've completed this part of the lab. Let me put you on pause so we could uh, knock out another section. Okay, so we just finished with part one. Now, uh, you are able to complete table three in your lab manual. After that is table four. There's no need for us to take any additional uh, measurements or do any additional experiments. A lot of the information required on table four is taken directly from table three. Then the rest of table four is just calculations. 
So moving on to table five, that's a new part of the experiment. And uh, we are need to, we're gonna need to incorporate a concave lens in this section. So let me uh, say a few words about that. This here is a uh, concave lens. I didn't go over its properties like I did with the um, convex lens. And I was gonna draw some ray diagrams, but this video is getting kind of lengthy. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to do that. You can do that on your own. I will just go over what we need to know for the lab. So this is our concave lens. And what I wanna say is that um, obviously when light is uh, refracted after going through it, it behaves differently uh, than a convex lens and there's different rules, so to speak, that you need to know uh, to trace out these rays on a ray diagram. But what we need to know for this is the focal length of a concave lens is negative. And that reflects on uh, how the um, uh, light behaves as it goes through it. So these lenses are always given, um, given a negative focal length. The other thing we need to know about these concave lenses is that with a single uh, concave lens, I can't do um, uh, an experiment like we previously did where I determined its focal length by um, an object and screen and focusing uh, an image on that screen. A concave lens never produces a real image. The images that they produce are always virtual, meaning they cannot be focused on a screen. So how do we determine the uh, focal length of a concave lens like we're supposed to do. And um, it's very simple. Uh, first, let me just say, there is, uh, let's consider two lenses, two thin lenses, butted up against each other. Uh, in other words, instead of just putting one of those lenses in that uh, holder, I grab two that we already experimented with and uh, squish them together and put them there. <clears throat> now. This is obviously going to have a different focal length than either of the two that I put in there. And the following expression holds true for this situation. 1 over F1 plus 1 over F2 is equal to 1 over F total, where F1 and F2 obviously are the focal points um, of the lenses I put in the holder, and F total is the focal length of the configuration. So um, this holds true, and it, do it doesn't matter what type of lenses we have. It doesn't matter if we have lenses with positive or negative uh, focal uh, uh, points. The other thing I want to mention is, let's see, oh, <clears throat> If I have a concave lens, then how do I go about uh, finding its focal length? What I am going to do, what we will do together is sandwich that concave lens with a convex lens. We're gonna put those two together, put them in our lens holder, and determine what the total focal length is. So we'll move this around until we get a nice image on our screen here from this source. And as always, this here is Q and this here is P, <clears throat> and this is the front of the lens, this is the back of the lens, so P is gonna be positive, Q is in the back of the lens, it will be positive as well, and I want to determine F total from this configuration of the two lenses sandwiched in there, so I use nothing more than what we've been using, and that is one over P plus one over Q, is equal to one over F. Now in this case, I'm gonna call F, F total. Just to remind us that this F total is the focal length of the system where we incorporated two lenses sandwiched together. So I just found out what F total is for those two lenses. Easy, right? Now I can insert this value into here. So this is known and Let's say F2 is our concave lens. At this point, we don't know what it is. F1, we are going to choose the lens with a nominal value of five. Now, when you 
and serve a number a value in the F1. Don't just put it five. Yeah, that's the nominal value, but we're gonna do way better than that, right? We experimentally determined what that actual focal length is. So I think your lab manual says, use the value that <clears throat> you trust the most. I don't know if you want to take averages or maybe use um, <clears throat> the value that we found using a light source infinitely far away. I'll leave that up to you. But bottom line is F1 is known. So using this expression here, we can now determine the focal length of F2, which is that concave lens, which we previously um, didn't know how to determine. Uh, because its uh, images are virtual. By the way, <clears throat> for our lens system, Q is positive, P is positive, positive, positive. That means that F total is going to be positive, so this is going to be a positive number. Uh, F1, that is one of our um, uh, convex lenses, so that is going to be that focal length is going to be a positive number. If you're doing everything right and you solve for F2, guess what? That F2 better come out negative <laughs> because we know already it is a uh, concave lens and its values are negative. So that F2 should come out negative. And that's all we need to know for this part of the lab. And let's get to it. All right, let's wrap up this week with this measurement here and uh, call it quits, then continue next week with the rest of the lab. So I have uh, two lenses in here. We have a two lens combination and uh, we're going to use this combination to focus an image on the screen there. Now, one of those lenses is a concave mirror and it has a nominal value of negative 10. If I only had that concave mirror in there, I wouldn't be able to get an image on that screen because the image produced by a concave lens is uh, indeed negative and it'll be a virtual image. So this new combination, we'll call it F total, the, the focal length of this two lens combination, F total. Uh, should be positive. It needs to be positive so that I could get a real image on that screen. And for F total to be positive, uh, we need to take a look at the uh, equation uh, that we're deriving F total from. And it is 1 over F1 plus 1 over F2 is equal to 1 over F total. Now, we know what F2 is. It's negative 10. So we're left with 1 over F1 minus 1 over 10 is equal to 1 over F total. So the first term, 1 over F1, needs to be larger than 1 tenth to get F total to be positive. So in order to get that term larger than 1 tenth, our focal length of lens 1 needs to be smaller than 10. And what we have is our <clears throat> nominal value of F is equal to plus 5 for the converging lens in there, in that lens holder with the concave lens. So it's 1 over 5 plus, I'm sorry, 1 over 5 minus 1 tenth is equal to 1 over F total, which should give us a total, uh, positive value for F total. Now, I pick P and let's see, this is placed at 178. 0 0.00 centimeters, so you should be able to figure out what P is. And I'll turn that uh, bulb on, then adjust the screen to get an image. And after I do that, or while I'll do that, well, let me put you up here so you can get a look at it. So hold on. So I have our image in focus, and our screen is located at 151.3. Now, if I move this farther out, it gets blurry. If I bring it back in, it gets into focus. And then if I move it closer to the lens, it gets out of focus. So I indeed put it at its correct position. Uh, there is, of course, air associated with it because it's kind of hard to get a nice crisp image. Different parts of the bulbs get focused. Uh, the camera doesn't do it justice, but you'll just have to trust me on that value I gave you of 151.3. So. Let me put you on pause and we'll do the last part of the experiment. And 
here is our last measurement. They want you to do it twice, get two trials of uh, P's with their corresponding Q's. So here is our new P value. And um, I didn't mention this last time, but of course, as always, our source is located at 190.00. Our <clears throat> lens this time is located at 172.00. And I already moved this and adjusted it, so I got an image and this is at 155.9. Uh, I won't put you up there to look at it. It's not very impressive. Uh, not as crisp as part one, those images in part one. So here is our second trial. And uh, when I focused the image this time, it was significantly smaller than the other image. Actually, it's uh, smaller than the bulb. And that makes sense, of course, right? Notice this P. I'm sorry, this Q, how smaller the Q is than the P, and magnification, if you recall, is negative Q over P. So uh, indeed, this is, uh, well, negative, it's inverted, and uh, Q being smaller than P, it's smaller than the object producing it. So there we go. We're done with this week. And... Uh, <clears throat> I know this was a long video, but you know what? It all works out for you in the end because this analysis is very, very, very simple. There's nothing There's nothing to it. Um, I was going to uh, provide you with photos so that you can get image um, heights for the first part uh, of our experiment, <clears throat> but uh, I'm gonna save you guys time on that. I'm gonna go ahead and measure those and just give them to you. I'll give them, give them to you on this video. We'll cut away in a second and I'll report those to you. Also, you are going to need the object height, this bulb height, and uh, I'll measure it with these uh, Bernier calipers and I'll give that to you as well. So all you basically need to do is just fill out those tables. I think the lab manual asks you to draw a couple of uh, ray diagrams uh, I'm not sure if it's for this part or next week, but uh, again, the analysis is very uh, minimal. So although uh, we spent a lot of time um, uh, doing this together, I don't think you're going to have to spend much time. You for sure not, uh, aren't going to have to devote as much time as you otherwise would in the other labs in this class. So um, when I was reporting the positions of the lens and the object, I gave it to you. Uh, to the nearest uh, hundreds place. That's way overkill, by the way. Um, after all, if I recall correctly, our delta Q, our air in Q, um, was like 3.2 centimeters. So obviously <laughs> that plus or minus 0.05 doesn't play a role. Uh, there's no uh, propagation of air involved in this lab, so you don't even need that much accuracy. Um, let's see. I already uh, looked at some of this data and I calculated the focal lengths based, up, based on our data um, from the first part of the lab and I just kept it to three significant figures uh, for those uh, focal lengths for those uh, 5, 10, 15, and 20 nominal values. Uh, I mean, what's the point of going reporting it to the hundreds place with so much error in your, in your delta Q? So these measurements were indeed overkill. Uh, but there you go, and um, I am going to measure those heights and report them to you in just a second. So I'll put you on pause. Okay, we are just about finished for this week. Let's just wrap it up with a few things. According to my lab manual, we are in the middle of page 64. In other words, next week when you continue this lab, because it is a two-part lab, we will begin on 4.4. Now, <clears throat> I had told you that I was going to give you the image heights so you don't have to uh, worry about measuring uh, them. If you recall, these pieces of paper were on our screen. When we got an image, I marked it with a pencil. So I already made these measurements, so don't worry about those. What we have is for nominal focal length five, lens negative 7.55 centimeters for the uh 10 we have negative 4.60 for the nominal f 15 negative 7.80 and for the 20 uh, centimeter focal length lens we have negative 
one five centimeters. The way we did them, remember though, is we started off with this one. We started off with the larger and went down uh, to the five. So all of these focal lengths were the convex lenses in part one. They all have uh, positive focal lengths. And I just want to clear up why these heights are negative. Uh, by the way, I call an image height H prime and the height of the actual object I just called H. According to your, in your lab manual, if you're using that table, um, they want you to fill out the image heights and they just call them H1. So you have, um, if you recall, for instance, for the F20, we picked a P1, found its Q1, and from that image, the height was negative 6.15 centimeters. Then we picked an another P, which they called P2, found a corresponding Q2, and we did not measure a height. Um, we weren't asked to do it a second time. So these image heights only pertain to the pick P1, the first time we picked that P1 value. So I wanted to remind you of that. And, um, oh, the negative side. Here is a ray diagram. And if you recall, if the um, object is positioned as such, um, it produces an image that is inverted. Let's hypothetically say that this was not inverted and it was upwards. If I was going to measure, or if you were going to measure the height of this image, it would be a positive value, but it's inverted in this case. So does it not make sense that when you report this height to um, adhere to the uh, chosen coordinate system, you should measure it negative, a negative height? So that is the purpose of these negative values. It was after all an inverted um, image, so we should measure them um, in the opposite direction, hence the negative value. The height of the object, which is the same in every case, right? We always use the same light bulb. That is this here. Actual light bulb or object, its height was 2.70 uh, centimeters. This of course is positive, that's our convention it's uh, upright. So there you go. Um, I'm going to do everything in my effort to make <clears throat> next week's lab. Um, let's shoot for half as long. Our main focus is going to be on the human eye, although there are three different measurements that involve lenses, sort of like we've, we've done this week, but they're not repetitive <clears throat> measurements like part one, where we had to pick all those P's and find the Q's. So next week um, should be shorter. And with that, look forward to seeing you next week.